You are welcome to the altar at any time while you're finding your seats, but the altar is open for you. Thank you so much this morning. We praise your name, Lord. We lift the name high. You are worthy of all our praises, Lord. You are amazing and loving and kind to us. We have no words, Lord, to express how much you mean to us, Lord. 
God this morning. We praise your name for you are alive. And because you are alive, we are alive too. We were dead in our sins, and you rescued us. You overcame death for us. We are victorious in you, Lord. Everything, God, is in the past. We are new creation because of you. You resurrected us to life. We praise your name today, Lord. We thank you for every, every family here, Lord, that is excited for your, your victory. And we are all, God, victorious because of you, Lord. Help us to live today and the weeks and days to come in victory, God, because you gave us the victory. You, Lord Jesus, ha have conquered everything. You finished the work on the cross, and you died, you died, and you resurrected and gave us victory over everything, God. Nothing that is in this world is more powerful than what you did for us. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Oh God, you are Lord of everything. You are Lord over, sick, over every sickness, over every sadness, over every pain today. We proclaim your name, Lord, over every family today. We proclaim healing, God. We pro proclaim joy. We proclaim peace in every heart today, Lord Jesus. Because you are our peace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for bringing us to this place today. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for being among us, in, in us, and around us this morning. Thank you, Lord. This morning, God, we pray for Sheila Bailey, Lord Jesus. We pray for her life, Lord Jesus, as she's in hospice, and she needs your touch, Lord. Father, comfort her. Embrace her, please, Lord Jesus. And we pray for Kathy, her mother, for Sarah, her niece, for Sheila, her sister, God. We just pray for this family, God. Father, that the same spirit that resurrected you from the dead will be with her today. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, we pray, Father. And we pray that our hearts will be open today, God. Our ears and our eyes open to receive what you have for us today through your word. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray and thank you that uh, you are with us. May you will be down in us, Lord. Have you weighing us today, Lord? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Easter, church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Linda, and I'm here this morning to share a, a need for our churches in Cuba with you this morning. Cuba is um, having a difficult time with their um, electric um, structure, and many times they don't have electricity. How many of you lost power last weekend? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's rough when you don't have power. For me, I don't have water, I don't have heat, I don't have lights. That's what our churches in Cuba are dealing with on a more often than not basis. We couldn't have church last week because we didn't have power here. There's no water, there's no heat, there's no lights. Um, some of our electrical stuff won't work. So a generator in Cuba
costs a hun uh, $50. No, that's not right. Sorry, I wish it was right. Because I, <laughs> I wish it was right for us. $500. I've got too many numbers going on. $500 for a generator. And there's 150 Nazarene churches in Cuba. So we're going to take a love offering over the next couple of weeks. So on your envelope, you can simply write Cuba on the bottom line, and that money will go to um, Cuba to distribute to the churches um, so that they can get a generator so that they will always be able to meet on their services. Pastor Eddie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, church, we're going to be in uh, the Gospel of Mark this morning, reading Mark's account of the resurrection. Mark chapter 16. We're going to begin in verse 1. Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, the gospel goes on, and if you, if you read through the, the next few verses after that, there's some clarification about what happened next, and that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, and that they did eventually go and tell the other disciples, um, but what we see here at the end is that they leave, and we're not entirely sure exactly what it means, um, but my assumption about it is that they were afraid on the way, that they didn't make any stops, that they had to go back to the house where they were staying and uh, breathe for a minute, maybe. Um, that's another sermon that I don't think we're going to get into today. We're going to look more at the beginning of the passage. Now, as I think about this story, as I think about, and I try to spend this Easter weekend every year, especially on Saturday, just reflecting on what that original weekend may have looked like for the disciples and the followers of Jesus. And we celebrate Good Friday, and we talk about everything that happened, and we come to church on Sunday, and we talk about Easter, and we celebrate Easter, but in between, there's that long Sabbath Saturday. So Jesus was crucified on Friday and was laid in the tomb sometime before the sun went down, but when the sun goes down on Friday evening, the Jewish Sabbath would begin. And that meant that they weren't really allowed to do much or go very far. They couldn't travel any distance. Now, I don't know about you, but when I am trying to keep my mind off of something, I often try to immerse myself in a project. Now, we in our day and age also immerse ourselves in things like television and video games and um, watching a movie, doing things like that reading too many things on social media. Uh, but they didn't have a lot of those things. And I don't know, if it were me, I think I would have tried to keep myself busy that Saturday. 
but they couldn't because it was a Sabbath. If it were me, I think I would have probably tried to flee Jerusalem, both for my own safety and just to get away from the memory of what had just happened and distance myself from it, and yet they couldn't. I also imagine that there was a lot of potential for these people that had left everything. And again, it wasn't just the 12, right? We have in this story these women who went to the tomb, but we know that there were many others that had been following Jesus that weren't the 12, that weren't the women, but, but had been following him around, listening to his teaching, going with him everywhere. There was a lot of potential for those people that had given up everything to follow this rabbi I think, at least, to be bitter. I mean, can you imagine how you could have felt if you quit your job, left your home, maybe lost your house, left all of your relationships behind? Have you ever gone three years without talking to someone? Can you imagine if you had left all that behind to follow the man that you thought was going to reestablish the kingdom of Israel, overthrow the Romans, bring victory and prosperity to God's chosen people, and then he was killed. And it was done. The story was over. Can you imagine how frustrated you would be if you made a sacrifice for something that ended up not being true? Have you ever given money to a cause only to find out that it was a scam? Or, or dedicated time and energy to something that didn't end up happening? See, I don't know about you, but I think one of the there's so many things about the story of Jesus and the story of Easter that are incredible and miraculous and unbelievable and unlikely, but to me, the fact that, that these women still wanted nothing but to go and care for the body of Jesus says a lot about them and a lot about who he was. That even though all of their expectations were just dashed to pieces, even though everything they thought was going to happen didn't happen, and in fact, the opposite happened, and there was no chance for it to get better because he was dead and in the tomb, still the women cared so much for him. And it's hard, it's hard to imagine, I think, Caring for someone so much that even if they failed to meet your expectations as much as, as Jesus failed to meet theirs, to still care that much about that person. And it's interesting if you look at the timing of this passage, and, and Mark gives us a couple of times. The first thing he says is when the Sabbath was passed, and then he says the women went out and bought Spices. So again, the Sabbath is from sunset to sunset, sunset Friday to sunset on Saturday. And so what happened was they were waiting at home. They were waiting because you couldn't do business on the Sabbath. All of the shops were closed. And so the women were waiting all day Saturday. And when the sun went down, when the day came to an end, when it was now, according to their calendar, no longer Sabbath, they went out in the darkness to go to the shops to spend what little money they had to buy spices. And then most likely because they couldn't travel at night or, or for whatever reason, they went back, they went home, and then they waited until morning. And then it says very early on the first day of the week, we assume that means as soon as the sun was up, as soon as it was light enough for them to see and make their way to the tomb and find the tomb as soon as they possibly could. 
as soon as they possibly could. They went out to anoint and prepare the body of Jesus. We see something incredible in the character of these women in this Easter story. And not only do we see something incredible in their character, we witness what happens when we follow them in that. Here's what I mean. These, these women, even though by, by all worldly standards, by all worldly standards, they had the right to be furious. They had the right to be disappointed, to be resentful that things turned out the way they did. By earthly standards, they had every right to be embarrassed and mortified that they were tricked into following this false messiah. By worldly standards, they have every right to just go home with their heads hung low in shame because they were so gullible and silly and, and fickle. To go home to those people that said, we told you you shouldn't follow that crazy preacher with all of the radical ideas. We told you it wasn't going to work out well. We told you that wasn't the way to go about doing it. By worldly standards, they had every right to just get it over with, go home and try to move on and rebuild their reputations, rebuild their lives. Except, except for one very important detail of this story, which is that these women had not just been following anyone for the past three years. They weren't just following some charismatic speaker. They weren't just following someone who had interesting ideas that could make them think and see things in a new way. They weren't just following someone who was kind or soft-spoken. They weren't following someone who was good at playing the political game who knew the right things to say to the right people to get what he wanted. They were following the Son of God, incarnate, walking, existing as a man. And because these women had been following Jesus for three years, their response, their response to the crucifixion was different than the response that the world would have, the response that our, our flesh, our bodies, our human instincts would have. You see, because our human instincts react differently in all sorts of different situations. The, the coping mechanisms that we develop as human beings as we go through life and we experience good things and we experience trauma and we experience joy and we experience pain and we experience people that are pleasant to be around and people that are unpleasant to be around. We learn to respond differently in different situations. We learn how to protect ourselves. We learn how to get what we need or want from other people, but they didn't respond in any of those ways. Their flesh would have told them to go out and talk about how they, they always suspected that maybe Jesus was a little bit off. Their instincts would tell them, as ours would, to start thinking about all of the things that he did and said that were really probably a little bit over the line and they should have known better. but they don't do any of those things. Because when we follow Jesus, we begin to recognize that ultimately, ultimately there's 
one way that Jesus responded in almost every situation, and it's what the women did. Their response in the midst of tragedy, as much as their response was the same in the midst of triumph, their, their response was to serve. And this is a big part of who we are as a church. This is a big part of our language. And, and this is just what it means to be a follower. And it doesn't seem like they thought about it at all. There was no, there's no record of any discussion. There's no record of, of some stayed back and some went to the tomb. It was just as soon as they possibly could, they made every effort to serve their crucified Savior. They went out and spent their money that they probably would have needed to travel back or something, right? We, they were all poor. None of them had a lot of money. They weren't well off. I don't know what their checkbook looked like, but I think it's safe to say that they didn't have the money to go buy a bunch of perfumes and spices, which were a luxury at that time. They went out and they spent their money to anoint a savior that as far as they knew, they would never see again. And then as soon as, as soon as the sun came out on that Sunday morning, they left and they went to the tomb. They didn't even know how they were going to get into it. They knew there was a large stone in front of the entrance. The other, gospel, uh, the other gospels describe how they saw him being placed in the tomb by Nicodemus. They, they knew what they were walking up to. They didn't even know if they could get to him. And none of that mattered. They served because they had been following Jesus all those years. And here's what's really fascinating about this story. It is those who served first that saw first. That those who, even if we, if we talk about the 12, even if they weren't doing anything wrong, because we don't, we don't have any idea what the 12 were doing during this story, but even if the 12 were back and they were praying, even if they were back and they were hoping, even if they were back at the house and they had good attitudes and they were in a right mind, none of that matters because they weren't doing what the women did. And because the women walked out in service to Jesus, the women saw him first. I've realized in my own walk with Christ how often that is true. That in the situations where I can't see him, the times in my life when I just, I'm in a hard situation, maybe it's a conflict with, with other people or whatever the case may be, if I want to see Jesus, If I want to see Jesus, the way for that to happen is always to serve. It's always to put others first. It's always to, to lay my own needs aside for the good of, to the good of other people, for the, for the good of, of Jesus, to put him first, to worship him before I worry about myself, to take care of another's needs before my own. The women saw first because they served first. Now, that doesn't just happen, right? And the reality is, if we all leave this place just really excited or convinced 
if we all leave this place just with a commitment to putting others first. It might last for the afternoon or a couple days or a couple weeks, depending on how much stamina and resolve you have. But the reality is we need to remember in this situation what came before the women going to the tomb and the miracle that was the women still being committed to Jesus. And the reality is we cannot develop, I cannot develop a life of service without keeping my eyes on the Savior. And you can't either. And here's the thing. I know myself. I know that if you're in relationship with me, I'm going to give you a lot of reasons to not want to put me first. I know that I am a human being, and if you're in relationship with me, I will give you a lot of reasons why you shouldn't help me in a certain situation. I will give you plenty of justifications for not doing this. Not because I'm a terrible person, I hope, and not because I just give in to that, not just because I... But speaking in reality, I, I know. I know what we are as people. I know that we will all give each other plenty of justification to not serve one another. And why should I give you what you've already taken ten times over? Why should I give money to a person who has stolen from me? So the only way this works is to keep our eyes on the Savior. To watch how he serves us, how he serves others, how he lays his life down, not just on the cross, but in everything that he did. And that might seem difficult. You might feel like you've got way too much trauma in your past to live a life like that. You might think that you're far too broken, you're far too hurt, that you can't trust people, that there's, there's way too much that has happened. There's way too much that's happened in your life to possibly be that kind of person. But on Easter, we need to remember that the very thing that gave the disciples and the women so much cause, so much justification for giving up on Jesus is the same thing that gives us hope today. Because there were a thousand things that could have been fixed. If Jesus had been put out of the temple, that could have been remedied. If Jesus had been exiled from Israel entirely, there, there were things that could be done to fix that. The high priest who exiled him or who banished him could have, could have you know, been removed or could have passed away and was replaced by someone more. I mean, there were a thousand situations that could have been bad that there was a remedy for, even if it was far-fetched, but there's no remedy for death. It doesn't matter how sick you are. It doesn't matter how faint your heart beats. If your heart is still beating, there's a way forward. There's a way out of it. But when someone's heart stops, it's the end. It's, death is the only thing that there's no coming back from. As a human on earth, death is the only thing there's no coming back from. Other things can be unlikely, but death is guaranteed. But what that means is, whatever impossibility you walked through those doors with this morning, it is smaller than what has already been overcome. 
whatever circumstance in your life you say, I just see no way forward. Yeah, technically there's a chance, but it's, there's not going to be resolution to this problem. There's no way out of this financial hole. There's no way this relationship will ever be restored. There's no way I can break this addiction. Whatever you walked in with, it may be unlikely. It may be infinitely unlikely in your mind. But that is always, will always be smaller than the death that was overcome. We have a risen Savior who has already overcome that which is more impossible than anything you will face in this life. And that is the good news of the gospel. Our worship team is going to come. We're going to sing one last closing song. There's very little required of us. There is both very little, and it often seems insurmountable. He has already achieved victory over death. He is ready to bring victory into your life. What remains is an invitation from you to him. An invitation from you to him to come in and heal, to fix, to change, permission granted to him to come in and do what he needs to do. So as we sing this closing song, I invite you, don't just, not that these are just, these aren't just words, that it's not just we're going to sing this to, to sing a song. I encourage you to pray this as you sing as a direct address to the Savior who wants to bring change into your life. Church, would you stand?
church have a wonderful rest of your easter uh there's no discipleship hour today go spend time with your families uh if you go out to lunch tip real well and uh have a wonderful week uh one more he is risen, he is risen amen you are dismissed